Hi everyone, welcome back to Live Darts. We are here at the Bet Victor World Cup and we've got five minutes with Matt. Matt, thanks for joining us. Anytime, Phil. It's been a while since we spoke up in Newcastle. There's a lot gone on since then. Yeah. H halfway through the season, roughly, how would you assess 2019 so far from the darts point of view? It's been interesting, hasn't it? You know, we've had the contenders, we've had um, you know, Barney bringing forward his retirement, then putting that on hold. You know, we're in the middle of an exciting World Cup now. Obviously, Michael winning the Premier League, not, not for the first time. Um, but, you know, people like Rob Cross at the top of their game, Gary Anderson coming back now. Um, so it's been, I don't know if we're in a transitional phase. You know, maybe there's a bit of a, not so much a changing of the guard, but um, a few new faces coming through and a few older faces um, being a bit less prevalent on the scene. So, um, you know, I think it's interesting. We'll see what the next uh, few months and years bring. You touched on it. We'll go straight into the Premier League because it was 16 gruelling weeks. Yeah. First of all, the contenders, from a PDC point of view and a commercial point of view, how do you think that went? Um, I think commercially it doesn't make a huge amount of difference. Um, you know, most of the tickets are sold before the Premier League starts. Um, you know, I don't know how many people did or didn't watch the Premier League just because of the contenders. Probably not that many. You know, viewing figures were up largely on last year, most of the nights. I think apart from Valentine's night where you can excuse people from not, for not watching the darts. Um, but, you know, the, the actual concept we thought was great. Some of the most memorable moments being the local guys, uh, Chris Doby in Newcastle, obviously Hendo in, in Aberdeen, Steve Lennon in Dublin, you know, Max Hopp in Germany, um, the, uh, the, the lads in, in the Netherlands as well, obviously Dimitri's from Belgium, but, you know, still a localish um, player and, and, you know, Jeffrey was, uh, was, was equally well received. So I think that probably the local lads created a bit more of a story, a bit more of a narrative than, than some of the others. It's not taking anything away from the other guys, not, not their fault, they weren't from the town that they were asked to play in. Um, but I think probably the local element of it was what really drove the stories. Have they given you an issue for next year? Um, because people seem the, the general public seem to enjoy the concept of it as well. Yeah, they did. Look, the Premier League will always evolve. You know, it was seven players, then it was eight players, then it was ten players, then with elimination night and you know the prize money grows, the venues change, new countries are added. So the Premier League never stands still; it always moves forward. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that we'll do exactly the same thing again or something slightly different or something very different. It's something we'll discuss and we'll see uh, how we feel the, the, the layout of the players that are either ready for the Premier League or nearly ready for the Premier League lies. But there's a huge amount of darts to be played before then. You know, it's, it's too early to be talking about who's going to be in next year's Premier League. Uh, and we'll, we'll assess that as we go along. Is it as well? Because there's not 10 standout players for the Premier League like there has been in years gone by. I don't mean that derogatory to the players in and around, but yeah. for the first time in a while there's not 10 names that you can go and grab and say they deserve a place. Yeah, I mean last year the 10 players who were selected were all players who lifted a PDC trophy throughout the year. Now you can debate the various merits of some of those events compared to others, doesn't really matter. The fact is they'd all won on TV, so that was a, a decent criteria to, uh, to, to, to take. Um, that won't be the case every year. You know, there'll be some players who've um, you know, won something. I mean, Nathan Aspinall won the UK Open. You know, absolutely phenomenal. I should have mentioned that at the start, really, when we talked about the highlights of the year so far, you know. But uh, it, there's, as I said, there's plenty more darts to be played, and we don't know whether one player is going to win six or seven events, or seven players are going to win one event. So let, let's wait and see ha how, that, um, how that pans out. I think, you know, the, the fact that you say that there aren't 10 standout players probably is, is credit to the strength in depth, more so than a lack of, of, of ability, because it shows that the, the top players so to speak, and not just sailing through every tournament and getting to the latter stages, uh, which is a good thing. We touched on the players and the prize money they're playing for. We've seen some shenanigans on the hockey, shall we say. Are players overstepping the mark now, or is it just their, their characters, and we haven't seen characters for a while, or is there a line in the sand where we don't quite know where it is? Yeah, the, 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 the tension... You know, there's a lot of tension, and that's brought on by prize money, it's brought on by social media, it's brought on by pressure to succeed from fan base and from, you, you know, what's within you as an individual. So, you know, the, the fact that people really want to win doesn't, doesn't bother us in the slightest, really. We want to see it done in a fair way. We understand that people want to show their character and we've always encouraged that as an organisation. You know, PDC Darts wouldn't be where it was today if we were breeding robots. Um, you know, listen, if somebody oversteps the mark, then they'll be dealt with by the DRA, which is independent to the PDC, and that's great, that's exactly how it should be, and that's how, you know, leading sports are organised, with a, with, a, with a disciplinary body that deals with things. And actually, if somebody does something wrong, well, then they face the punishment, and then everybody moves on. It doesn't make the sport better or worse, it's just what happens in sport. 
The O2 as well for finals, well, there was a lot of talk. Yes, there was an awful lot of people in there, about 10,000, I understand. But where it's such a big arena, doesn't the atmosphere lose something because it's not full? Yes, it's done a lot of tickets, but for me, it was probably the worst atmosphere of the whole 16 weeks, yeah, and it should be the showcase final. It's, it's difficult. The O2 is an extremely prestigious venue globally. It's, a, it's a, you know, an absolutely tier one venue for us to be staging the final at. So you know, when we talk to international partners and we say we've got an event that's at finals at the O2, then they all understand what that means, um, and that's very important. As you say, there was a lot of people there, and it wouldn't make sense to do a London Premier League night uh, earlier on in the run because it'd be so soon off the back of Ali Pali. So you have to make that further away. So fans in the southeast, you know, they're not going to want to go to darts immediately off the back of going to another event. So, you know, we, we, we have the demographic data. We know who goes to those events, where they're from. And, you know, it, it makes sense to have that kind of in the middle of the year. Um, you know, the, the atmosphere wasn't great. Look, I'm from London and, and sometimes we may be guilty of when we go to a, an event, we want to watch the atmosphere rather than be the atmosphere. You know, which you maybe don't get in towns like Aberdeen, for example, where everybody wants to get stuck in yeah, themselves, right, you know, so, yeah. so there might be a little bit of a, not so much a north-south divide, but maybe a little bit of a London thing going on there, um, which we perhaps don't see at Ali Pali, because most of the fans from, who go to Ali Pali have travelled from all over, you know, whereas, whereas people who go to the O2 are, uh, you know, more local, um, and perhaps they're going for, di you know, for, with a different m mindset, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. I, I still think the O2 has a, a good atmosphere, and I wouldn't say it was a bad event in the slightest. It's extremely difficult. Obviously, it's a 16, 17,000 seat venue, which we don't fill, um, so the upper tier isn't full. Uh, and because of the design of that venue, the upper tier is a long way up with the two levels of boxes. So we're conscious of fans in the upper tier there, and also at venues like Manchester, where there's an upper tier. We're conscious that we don't want them to feel too detached from the event. It can be quite difficult if you sat there looking down on everybody having a great time on the tables and dancing around yeah, and enjoying right. the walk-ons, and you're sat in the tiers, you know? So um, it was stuff we always bear in mind and see how we can make the experience better you know you've seen we won best best match day experience at yeah. the recent sports business awards for, for the world championship so what we do there works it's how we can tra translate that into other events um, but there's no plans at the moment to move the Premier League final away from the O2. World rankings there's been a lot of talk even amongst the players on social media about the world rankings I know we spoke probably last year do you think the system is working the two-year cycle because I use the one that stands out. James Wade won three Pro Tours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he went down a place in the rankings. He had a move. So, is there any forward thinking to maybe change the ranking system to make it a little bit more current and keep up to date? Because Michael could not play an event for I think six months yeah. and still be ranked world number one. He could, but obviously Michael's been extremely successful over the last couple of years. Yeah. It's a bit of a, it's a bit of an anomaly. You know, you wouldn't normally get a player that's won so such a high percentage of of, of all the events. I think. You have to look at it. We, again, we evaluate everything. We have feedback from the PDPA and the players, and we assess things and, 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 and change as we feel appropriate. Don't forget, the PDC tour is very young. You know, a lot of tours you look at, like the PGA or the ATP tour and stuff, they've been going for donkey's years, like de decades and decades and decades. They've had time to evolve, time to modify their systems, time for their tournament structures to settle down and things like that. We're still very young in that respect and, st and still evolving. Um, so we constantly assess th where things are. Um, and there might be things that aren't quite right at the moment. We think two years works because ultimately if you come into the system, you need to have two years to, to get to grips with it because one year just isn't enough. Blink and you'll miss it. Well done, you've earned your tour card. Oh, sorry, you've lost it again. You know, you've got to give people two years to get into that. And of course, you need a level playing field as well. World Series, it's about to, to start. First mm -hmm. one in Vegas. Yeah. First of all, what's the reason for only having five this year? Two, are there any new territories that you're looking to go into maybe in 2020, 2021? Yeah, I mean, look, we've only got five this year as opposed to the six that we've had in, in recent years. We are hopeful, we were hopeful of getting something restarted in the Middle East. Um, the, the, the period, obviously our calendar is extremely busy. So the amount of, the, the, the open windows that we've got to do World Series events are very, very narrow. You know, we can't just stick one in the middle of March because obviously we're right in the middle of Premier League. We can't stick one in the middle of October because we've got TV events every weekend. So we, you know, we, we have a very limited window in which we can do World Series events. That has to fit with venues, it has to fit with local promoters, it has to fit with broadcasters. And actually in the case of the Middle East, it has to fit with religious festivals because Ramadan falls during that period. So we're unable to get a license for an event in the Middle East during that period. So Ramadan will, will move um, in future years and we're hopeful of returning to the Middle East 
uh, to bolster the numbers again. China's a very difficult market. We had a local promoter, maybe didn't work as well uh, as, as it could have done. You know, so we, we've taken a year off in China to reassess where we're at. Uh, New Zealand, we've moved to Hamilton, sold a huge number of tickets, been very successful. Melbourne, Melbourne and Brisbane again in Australia, Vegas again in America, and of course Germany here where, where we always you know, do very well. So we're comfortable with the five events we've got. It was a shame we couldn't get six, but it, it was just a, a kind of unfortunate set of circumstances really, and it's something we'd look to restore for future years. Criteria for the World Series this year, it's a bit samey, I'm going to say, from a, this is from a fan's point of view. And I know we've joked about it at one of the Premier League events. Has the days of giving the young guns a blood in the World Series perhaps gone now for the commercial aspect of selling tickets for the well-known names? Well, I think there's two things to bear in mind. One, you're looking at it from a UK fan's point of yeah. view. You know, if you're a fan in Melbourne, Brisbane, Hamilton, Las Vegas, Germany, in Shanghai in the past, or you know, other cities we've been to in the past, if the darts is only coming to your area once a year, you're going to want to see the big names. That's the nature of the beast. You go and talk to people who promote tennis. They want to take Novak Djokovic. They want to take Rafa Nadal. They want to take Roger Federer. You know, talk to people who promote golf. They want to take Rory McIlroy. They want to take Tiger Woods. You know, and that's with the greatest respect to, to, to younger players and players coming through. You know, when you go to a local market, you have to deliver your grade A product. People are used to seeing the Premier League in those countries. They're used to seeing those players. And that's who they want to see when we go there. And we know that because of the research that we've done and the feedback that we get. That's not to say that we don't want to blood people. However, we feel that this year the Contenders series gave us that opportunity to blood players on the big stage, probably without the need to fly them all the way around the world. Um, you know, so we think probably for this year the Contenders probably outweighed the idea of taking somebody all the way to Australia just to give them a little, a, a little taste of, of it. But that's not to say that it won't, it won't happen again in the future. Something off the back of like matching we've done with boxing and things like that, the Next Gen series, there was a thing online which I think, I don't know if you got involved with it or not, but I know you were tagging it, about maybe a stream next gen series whilst the World Series is on. Is that something that potentially you'd look at? No. No? There wouldn't be any commercial value in that whatsoever. No, it was just something I saw on Twitter. Yeah, I yeah. The, the, the no, it doesn't work. I mean, if you look at what, how they do that in boxing, um, they put on small, relatively small hall shows with young up and coming fighters. The difference in boxing is that boxers sell their own tickets. You know, if you can find me 10 dart players who will bring 500 people to each show guaranteed, then yeah, we'll put, we'll put a show on. But you know, we know from the, look, tickets fly out of the door for the big events. We have to work a little bit harder to sell them for some of the other events. You know, the idea of putting on a show with exclusively non big names in it, it isn't, isn't something that we, we feel would work. As well, Gary Anderson returns here. Is it a good thing for the sport now he's back? And do you think the sport's yeah, missed Gary Anderson? Yeah, look, I think you know any any elite level player is is a miss when they're not there. You know, Gary's very popular. He's a great player. You know, charismatic guy. He's someone that we we like seeing around. And by the way, he looks great this weekend. You know, he's he's in shape. He looks healthy. He's playing well. You know, and a, and a fit and, and top of his game. Gary Anderson is nothing but good for darts. Young Liam Bennett has caught the headlines. I know we saw him at Power of the Tower since, and he's gone on to hit a nine darter. Yeah. Still only was he 13, maybe 14 yeah. years old. Is there any plans to not fast track him, but maybe change the rules slightly so he can play on like the PDC development tour and stuff like that in maybe next year? Yeah, I mean, look, we're obviously aware of Leighton's progress, and as you say, that night at the Tower of London, he showed his ability, and, and of course, we've followed you know, what, what he's done since. But it's not just him, it's about a lot of the other teenage kids who are playing, boys and girls who are playing in the JDC. Uh, tour and on other uh, other sort of associated events around at the moment because we wouldn't look to change a rule just for one person in, in that respect that wouldn't be the right way to go about doing it but if we felt that there was um, justification for bringing players into our tournaments at a younger age and that's something we'd look at there's obviously associated issues around kids you know we've got things to do with child protection and making sure that the right welfare is provided and everything like that um, so th they're all things that are new to us and things that we'd have to look at um, but obviously Leighton's making all the headlines at the moment and there's no doubt as things stand he looks like being a big star in the future. Last one for me, the lads from Q School, Glenn Darren in particular, and only um, Mark McGinney, uh, Jamie Hughes and all that have come over. Does that show the strength and depth within the sport at the moment? They're coming over and winning titles and producing performances straight away as well. I think so, look, I mean with all due respect if you want to be a full-time dart player and you want to earn a decent living this is the only place you can do that. You know, so it's a statement of intent from those guys to show that they want to, to, to make darts their livelihood and have a good life out of it, get a nice big house and a nice car and all, all the nice trappings that go with success. But it's a, it's a lot of commitment 
Um, you need a lot of bottle, you need a lot of support, you know, so it's not just a case of being good on the dartboard, you've got to be good off the dartboard as well. And those guys that you mentioned and plenty of others as well are all, are all showing that, that, that they've got the desire and the ability to do that. So, you know, good luck to them, we'll keep providing the opportunities and, and they can keep taking them. Matt, absolute pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for that, as always. Anytime. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Cheers.